Hello students, welcome to EBG Pachala. I am Imkong Tanlapungan from Department of Anthropology, University of Delhi. Today we are going to discuss the module The Dispersion of Modern Humans, Molecular and Morphological Patterns of Relationship under Paper, Human Origin and Evolution. Well, the learning objectives of the module are number one, to understand about the dispersion of modern humans. Number two, to understand about the molecular patterns of relationship. Number three, to understand about the morphological patterns of relationship. Well, the biological variety of living human populations from the beginnings of anthropology has been approached through the study of race. For almost two centuries following Linnaeus, anthropologists attempted to define discrete units of humanity and to find criteria for distinguishing among these races as sharply as possible. Individuals best conforming to such criteria were viewed as pure. All this happened before the emergence of genetics. Human populations in different parts of the world have adjusted to the physical environment in various ways, but surprisingly, little is known of the adaptive significance of these physical differences. Such variation must be an outcome of the evolution of modern Homo sapiens, although we have learned little about just how this happened. Now we will discuss the traditional studies of race. Traditional studies of race, there have been several attempts to categorize the variety of present humans. Many of these are unnecessarily Procrustean, but have some value in purely descriptive terms. A typical classification based on human physical variation is as follows. Caucasoid from Northern Europe to Northern Africa and India, these are depigmented to a greater or lesser degree. Hair in males is generally well developed on the face and body and is mostly fine and wavy or straight. A narrow face and prominent narrow nose are both typical. Necroid or conchoid in sub-Saharan Africa, skin pigment is dense, hair woolly, noses broad, Faces generally short, lips thick, and ears are squarish and lobeless. Stature varies greatly from pygmy to very tall, and in the latter, the face is long. The most divergent group is the Khoisan, that is the Bushman and the Hotendot peoples of Southern Africa. Mongoloid found in all parts of Asia except the West and South India, in the Northern and Eastern Pacific, and in the Americas. The skin is brown to light, hair is coarse, straight to wavy, and sparse on the face and body. The face is broad and dense to flatness. The eyelid is covered by an internal skin fold known as epicantic eye fold amongst this population, but such folds are less marked or absent in other races. The teeth often have grounds more complex than in other people, and the inner surfaces of the upper incisors frequently have a shovel appearance. The Chinese, Koreans, and Japanese are the typical populations and have probably shown considerable expansion in historical times. In Central and Northeastern Asia and among Han, the flatness of face and nose is still more marked. In more marginal populations, such as the Aino of Japan, Aboriginal Taiwanese, Philippine Islanders, Indonesians, and Southeast Asians, these traits are less marked. The same is true of Polynesians and Micronesians. In American Indians, the face is usually broad, but nasal breaches are apt to be more prominent relative to the eyes. The teeth are especially complex in pattern, and shoveled incisors are particularly prevalent. Astroloid, 
the aboriginals of Australia and Melanesia. Their skin is dark, hair predominantly wavy or frizzy in case of Melanesia, with blondness in children, which is lost in adulthood, being common throughout. The head is long and narrow, the forehead sloping with prominent brow ridges, and the face has a projecting jaw. Now we will talk over the molecular patterns of relationships. Genetic analysis became possible with the discovery of systems of blood groups. This work was the first to emphasize the weakness of previous racial studies. Vast amounts of data now show population differences in blood group frequency. As such, antigen systems directly express the genotype which more complex traits like skin color or body height do not. It was once expected that a coherent genetic classification of the human population might emerge. This has not been the case. The APO blood groups were first described in 1900. They are strongly patterned over the surface of the world. Groups A and B are both at high frequency in Africa and much of Asia, extending into the Pacific through Melanesia. In Northwestern Europe, B is lower, O and A higher. In native populations of the Americans, A and B are almost absent, except in Western Central North America, where A becomes common. In Polynesia, B declines towards the periphery and A and O rise, and in Aboriginal Australia again, B is absent and A is high. Such a distribution is difficult to interpret in purely historical terms. Gene frequencies appear to be relatively stable over moderate amounts of time. For example, gypsies in Western Europe preserve frequencies close to those of their original home India. The worldwide distribution might suggest the operation of selection, but little is known about such selection on the ABO system, although a history of differential resistance to disease has been suggested. The founder principle and genetic drift may be more important. For example, the settlement of Polynesia, beginning about 1500 BC, involved a serial colonization of island groups eastwards. Such a succession of small groups, probably composed of related families, each drawn as a minor part of the last is the ideal situation for the reduction and loss of a gene by chance in small samples. Similar chance events may have applied in the small tribal populations of Australia, which probably suffered occasional extinction and repopulation during an incubation of the continent going back to about 500,000 years. For the Americas, Movement by immigrants from Asia across the relative cold of the Bering Strait area might have led to a purge of disease organisms, so that both chance and the removal of an agent of selection by disease caused the A and B alleles to decrease. Figure 1 is depicting the frequency of genes O of the APO blood group system. Figure 2 is showing the frequency of genes B of the APO blood group system. An evolutionary tree based on the frequencies of 58 different blood group genes is presented in figure 3. As natural selection eliminates history, the present distribution of the APO gene frequencies is unlikely to retain much evidence of ancient migrations and population relationships. Now, the same may be true of most other blood group systems. The MNS system is complex. The M allele is somewhat more frequent than N in Europe and Africa. M is very high in the Americas and N very high in Australian Aboriginals. The races that is, the CTE system is more complex still, with many variants. 
Again, the adaptive qualities of each in relation to disease are not known, and the distribution might reflect older disease patterns that have changed greatly in recent times. The MNS and RISA systems have variants peculiar to or especially frequent in Africa to a degree that might suggest a long isolation of these populations from those of Europe or Asia. Similarly, the Duffy system with two antigens, that is A and B, also has a silent allele, which is known as FY1, which is virtually restricted to Africa and gives some protection against the form of malaria caused by Plasmodium vivax. Plasmodium falciparum, which causes more taxing malaria, is resisted by hemoglobin S, the hemoglobin cycling variant. Now, the GM trait of blood serum consists of several antigens which occur as sets of linked loci inherited as groups or haplotypes. It shows sharper differences among major populations than do most red cell systems and may hence be more informative about their past distributions. Now, the antigens on white blood cells resemble the GM system in that they are complex linked blocks of genes and also promise an insight into the long-term association of such linkage groups with particular populations. All the systems are useful for microevolutionary studies. Sometimes they even show some correspondence with local linguistic change. For example, on the island of Bougainville in the Solomons, Melanesian-speaking Papuan languages have MNS frequencies quite distinct from those of neighboring tribes speaking Astronesian languages, whose frequencies resemble those of Astronesian speakers elsewhere in the Solomons. However, the same distinctions do not hold for New Guinea. A further insight into patterns of relatedness emerges when blood systems are combined to give a compound measure of genetic distance. Europeans then appear to be closer to Africans and Australoids to Mongoloids. However, most of the variation in blood groups is between individuals within populations and between small groups, not between the so-called races of humankind. Such compound measures of affinity are particularly influenced by one or a few highly variable systems such as GM, so that newly discovered genes may not provide much new information. Genetic study at the molecular level is so laborious that it has not yet given much new insight into the differences among human populations. One attempt has been made using the gene cluster of human P hemoglobin. Using restriction enzymes to find cleavage sites detects the presence or absence of these sites and produces a series of closely linked genetic differences or haplotypes. Study of individuals from different regions suggests that Africans form one grouping and all non-Africans, including the Melanesians, Polynesians, and Asians, form another. Now, one application of molecular technique may be particularly promising. This uses the DNA of the mitochondria, the sites of energy metabolism in the cytoplasm of the cells. This extranuclear DNA, or we say the mitochondrial DNA, consists in humans of a loop of 16,500 base pairs, far less than the total chromosomal DNA. It is hence much easier to analyze in detail and the complete sequence of mitochondrial DNA is known. This DNA is transmitted only in the maternal line via the ovum and is not subject to the shuffling of gene groups, that is recombination found in the nucleus. Change takes place only through mutation, which takes place at a much higher rate than in nuclear DNA. Studies of mitochondrial DNA determine maternal lineages. This may be very ancient, 
they differ by virtue of substitutions at various restriction sites. One study based on 12 restriction enzymes revealed 196 polymorphic sites, many of which can distinguish among a number of different female lineages. The largest number of different lineages occurs in Africa. By this hypothesis, Africa seems to be the source of populations elsewhere in the world with new lineages arising in the emergent population. Thus, other regions of the world have both African and non-African lineages. Europe was colonized by populations having a large number of female lineages, albeit fewer than Africa with Asia, Australia and New Guinea founded by successively smaller numbers of lineages. Now, this pattern might arise because population bottlenecking has reduced the numbers of lineages. The assemblages of lineages in a particular place are not specially related, although one new Kenya cluster seems to have its closest relative in Asia and not Africa. In Asia, a deletion of a short section of the mitochondrial DNA is common to Chinese, Japanese, and some Pacific people. It is also found in South America. Rates of lineage divergence are about 2-4% to per million years. Using the probable times of human colonization for America and New Kenya as a reference point. Now, if this clock is accurate, a common ancestor might then have existed in Africa at some time from 290,000 to 140,000 years ago. Humans may have migrated from Africa during this period and because the oldest population cluster of types outside Africa with no African types is estimated to be 90,000 to 180,000 years old, this sets an approximate minimum age for the emergence of these people from Africa. Mitochondrial DNA gives some fascinating hints about ancient migrations. However, in other animals such as mice and fruit flies, patterns of distribution of mitochondrial DNA appear to give positively misleading clues about patterns of historical relatedness among populations. The mitochondrial case is as yet far from proven. However, most molecular patterns do lean towards the hypothesis of dispersal of modern humans from one general area, that is Africa. They also imply that racial distribution is two-dimensional, with no important contributions to modern populations from ancient people such as local survivors of Homo erectus. Mitochondrial DNA mapping does seem to provide the possibility of long-range probes of the past. None of the lineages yet found is sufficiently divergent from others to suggest that it arose before the appearance of modern Homo sapiens. Now, I will talk about the peopling of Pacific. The patterns in genes in modern populations confirm some of his views and aid a great deal to our understanding of this area, which includes some of the first and some of the last parts of the world to be occupied by modern humans. The archaeological and fossil records suggest that we got to some places very early on. Recent finds of stone tools and red ochres in Arnhem Land in northern Australia show that humans were there between 60,000 and 50,000 years ago. They reached Tasmania more than 20,000 years ago, extinguishing many native plants and animals on their way. In Papua New Guinea, too, there has been human habitation for at least 40,000 years. In contrast, Many of the Pacific islands have been settled for less than 5,000 years and islands such as Pitcairn were occupied 1,000 years ago with populations that then became extinct. Language supports this pattern of settlement. In Papua New Guinea, 
an ancient homeland populated by groups isolated from each other by geography and culture. There are about 700 languages, many of which are very distinct and have only a few speakers. Now, in the highlands, there were ditches for drainage and for growing daru tubers at least 9,000 years ago. The other main center of languages and of an expanding agricultural population in the Far East was in the Yangtze Basin in eastern China about 8,000 years ago. These rice growers spread southwards and were the source of a vast movement of people, cultures, and genes that today covers much of Eastern Asia and the Pacific. Their culture and the Austronesian languages associated with it spread to the Philippines by 3000 BC, to central Polynesia by 200 BC, and ultimately to Hawaii. AD 300 and New Zealand AD 800. The vast area has a common linguistic heritage. The word for I, that is Mata, is the same in the Philippines, Fiji, Samoa, and Eastern Islands. Many genes for blood groups, enzymes, mitochondrial DNA, and nuclear DNA sequences have been mapped in the Pacific region. Some clear large scale patterns emerge. There is a genetic link as the 18th century voyagers saw between the modern populations of Southeast Asia and those of the myriad of small islands making up Polynesia. This is clearly seen in the patterns of the maternally inherited mitochondrial genome. Now, in Japan and East Asia, many people lack a short section of the DNA in the mitochondrion. And this deletion does no harm, but is a characteristic of Southeast Asian populations. It is also found throughout Polynesia and on the coast of Papua New Guinea, bolstering the linguistic ties that show this people originally came from somewhere in that part of Asia. However, the native populations of Central New Guinea and of Australia with their wild diversity of language do not carry this ancestral cue. They traveled more slowly and for far smaller distances than did the Polynesians. Populations of the most distant Polynesian islands are genetically rather uniform, suggesting not surprisingly that they went through a series of bottlenecks as they spread across the Pacific in the isolated parts of Papua New Guinea too. There is a shortage of genetic variation showing that these mountain valleys are just as isolated. Now, the relationship of morphological patterns will be discussed. Other information is also useful in studying historical relationships. Fingerprint and palm print patterns in Pacific populations show a striking separation. That is, Polynesians, Micronesians, both speakers of Astronesian languages, Melanesian, Astronesian speakers, and other Melanesians further divided by the Papuan language spoken can all be distinguished. This may reflect a history of subdivision and thrift in these island populations. This pattern is much clearer than that which emerges from blood group studies in the Pacific. The dispersion of these populations may have started 4,000 years ago or more. Fingerprint analyses have not yet been carried out on continental populations, but the method might be valuable for studying problems such as the history of migrations among American Indians. Other useful morphological characters include those of the skeleton. Cranial measurement had its beginning in the first half of the 19th century. A large amount of information soon became available as skulls could be collected while living individuals could not. The only analysis was to use ratios or indices to convey shape. The cranial index that is spread over length into 100 class specimens as stolicocranial, long with an index below 75, mesocranial and brachycranial. Brachy Brachycranial means short index over 80. Other ratios also proliferated. Relative height of skull, height of face, breadth of nose, and so on. 
This approach was often used to produce a classification based on combinations of such categories. Populations of skulls were commonly subdivided into types which were supposed to have entered into the population at its origin. In spite of the vast amounts of information gathered, it soon proved impossible to make effective comparisons or to produce population histories based on anything more than supposition. The coefficient of racial likeness was an attempt by the English statistician Carl Perlson to compare skull series by combining a number of measurements. This was a first attempt to gather the information, present into a whole, and it gave impetus to the collecting of sets of skulls. However, the method failed to take account of the correlation among measurements and hence placed too much emphasis on difference in the overall size. Since Pearson's time, this problem has been overcome by computers and the development of multivariate statistics. This summarizes measurements as a new set of transformed figures between which correlation is removed and which are more specific in meaning and importance. Discriminant functions or principal components are the usual forms. This helps to relate populations to each other and they also reveal a lot about the underlying differences in form. Such techniques used to gather populations of skulls into groups corresponding quite well with geography. That is, Africans, Europeans, Australo-Melanesians, Far East Asiatics, Polynesians, and American Indians. Now, discrimination among these is mainly based on distinctions not fully revealed by the traditional measurements or ratios. Breadth of the cranium, particularly at the base, is a major factor as it is relatively anterior or posterior positioning of the face, especially at the sides of the facial marks. Such distinctions are most marked between Inuit or Inner Asiatic Mongoloids, such as periods of the leg bicycle region on one hand and Africans and Australomelanesians on the other. Find distinctions in the relative projection of the root of the nose and the eye orbit are also important. Mongoloids, such as the Puriates, have a relatively high face. Inuit of Greenland have very flat faces with a flat nasal settle. Polynesians, as exemplified by Hawaiians, have large and quite flat faces. They are distinguished by a particularly prominent upper nasal and facial region. American Indians and Europeans are not far from the global mean in any direction, although the Americans are somewhat closer to Hawaiians than to Europeans. American Indians have a flat fish face, but the root of the nose and the space between the eyes is relatively high. Australians and Melanesians have narrow skulls and low faces with a jutting tooth bearing part which together with a protruding eyebrow ridge distinguishes them well from Africans. The African face is short but broadish across the eyes and the skull is narrow. Though small skulled Southern African sand, that is the Bushmen, they share the main African characters. Such cranial analysis can also be used on prehistoric material. Now, an analysis of size and shape distances based on the means of nine measurements on a large number of European skull series from the Mesolithic to Roman times shows a general homogeneity among groups from any given cultural complex such as the Bill Baker people in the 3rd millennium BC. It also discerns two major cranial forms, that is, long-skulled or the broad-faced in the north and long-skulled or narrow-faced in the south. The latter form, sometimes referred to as Mediterranean, appears to have expanded at the expense of the former, that is, the Cro-Magnoid. 
These rail differences in skull form do not coincide at all with the long accepted typological races in Europe, that is, the Nordic, the Mediterranean, and the Alpine. Indeed, the last traditionally seen as invading physical group disappears. Such multivariate comparisons might also be used to study much older specimens, let Bleistocene skulls do in some cases approximate to the original successors. Examples are Metek I for Europeans and Kilor for Australians. There are, however, difficulties in applying these techniques which are only partly due to insufficient material. One is statistical, another arises from the fact that there are slightly greater differences between ancient and modern people than appears to the eye. For example, specimens from Liuqiang in southern China or Border Cave in South Africa have a prominent eyebrow ridge in an otherwise modern appearing skull. Modern humans appeared in different parts of the world at widely different times. In Africa and Southwest Asia, they were early. They may have been excluded from Europe, constrained by the presence of Neanderthals, as they appeared there only about 38,000 years ago, when they had already reached Australia and a few Melanesian islands. The Far East is difficult to assess. The Liu Jiang skull, however, is believed to have a date of 67,000 years. The remains from Zokodian, that is Upper Cave, are 20,000 to 30,000 years old. Although modern, their shape suggests that they are not antecedent to today's Chinese and their affiliation is not clear. The New World does not help us with the emergence of modern populations, generally because the first American arrived so recently. There is considerable variation in physical and cranial form among the indigenous American populations, which might result from differences among arriving migrant groups. It might also arise from local microevolution and the founder effect. On the other hand, some features are shared by all New World populations, which distinguishes them within the general Mongoloid group. The figure 4 presents the Indo-European family tree reflecting geographical distribution. Figure 5 depicts the trees of relatedness for genes and languages. There are two views of the arrival of the first American one involving linguistic and genetic evidence envisage three main migrations. Paleo-Indian, the earliest and the one responsible for most of the variation, Na Tene, now centered on northwestern North America, and Eskimo Iliud. The migrating populations are supposed to have originated in three areas of northeastern Asia, the North Coast, the Interior, and the Pacific Littoral, respectively. The second hypothesis proposes a first movement at perhaps 20,000 years ago, which penetrated south via a corridor between the existing ice sheets and a second that was held up until the ice caps melted and which gave rise to northern tribes and Inuit. A problem in all this is the poverty of archaeological evidence before about 120,000 years ago. A few cave sites in North and South America, such as Petra Furata in Brazil, are believed by some workers to give such evidence, but not all are persuaded. In spite of much research, there are no signs of widespread occupation of the Americans during the Blastocene or of coherent cultural patterns like those evident in Europe and Australia. Australasia is another matter. Although there were considerable ex expanses of water along the migration road, people were occupying Australia and New Guinea, then joined by a land bridge at least 50,000 years ago. Aboriginal populations of recent times show little variation. North Australians are perhaps closer to Melanesians than are others, and the Tasmanians, now extinct, also differed slightly from other Australian populations. 
There was greater variation at many times before 6,000 years ago to the extent that the specimens are often divided into robust and crucial groups. To the former belong the more heavily built skulls from Koswam, Legnichi, and Wilantra legs. In the later group are the less robust specimens from Lake Mungo and Kilor. Migrations from different regions have been postulated to explain these differences as has input from a Southeast Asian Homo erectus population. Figure 6 displays the possible dispersal of modern Homo sapiens. Skulls of early Homo sapiens are presented in Figure 7. However, the morphological diversity within early Australians was merely variation on only one fundamentally similar form as Melanesian and Australian populations form a broad cropping, while craniometry distinguishes from those of other Asian regions. Any attempt at an analysis of long-term population movements needs a starting point or root. This is not only hard to define but also presupposes the existence of one original population and migration outwards from this single source. Evolutionary trees, however extensive the information on which they are based, are hence not in themselves able to distinguish between the two hypotheses for modern origins. However, some findings do emerge from such comparisons. Although not many specimens are available, skulls that can readily be related to fully modern specimens do not extend far into the past, perhaps around 30,000 years. By contrast, existing populations are surprisingly close to one another. Neanderthal and other archaic specimens are certainly far removed from modern populations. These results appear to indicate the explanation of regional continuity and evolutionary divergence. However, they are neutral in the matter of African origins for Homo sapiens. Although the earliest skeletal remains, that is Lake Mungo, are about 30,000 years old, the continuous archaeological record in Australia may go back at least as far as 50,000 years ago. As there was probably only one general avenue of entry to the continent, and as there are no signs, in spite of the robusticity of such specimens as cause swarm of evolution from Homo erectus within it, Australia probably contains the earliest evidence of fully modern humanity outside Africa and the Near East. The implications of this for the theory of the spread of modern humans from Africa to the East remain uncertain. Now let us summarize the module. The biological variety of living human populations since the beginning of anthropology have been approached through the study of race. For almost two centuries following Linnaeus, anthropologists attempted to define discrete units of humanity and to find criteria for distinguishing among these races as sharply as possible. Individuals best conforming to such criteria were viewed as pure. All this happened before the emergence of genetics. Human populations in different parts of the world have adjusted to the physical environment in various ways, but surprisingly, little is known of the adaptive significance of these physical differences. The worldwide distribution might suggest the operation of selection, but little is known about such selection on the APO system, although a history of differential resistance to disease has been suggested. The founder principle and genetic drift may be more important. Other useful morphological characters include those of the skeleton. Cranial measurement had its beginning in the first half of the 19th century. A large amount of information soon became available as skulls could be collected while living individuals could not. The only analysis was to use ratios or indices to convey the shape. Now, the implication of this theory of the spread of modern humans from Africa to the East still remains uncertain. That's all for this module. Thank you.